Uh, welcome everyone to the Actualize Online Capstone Presentations. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone watching on YouTube Live as well as YouTube in the future. Uh, my name is Brian Rice and I've been helping the presenters learn the fundamentals of web development over the last 12 weeks. Um, each presenter has chosen an idea for an app and has proceeded to build that app from scratch uh, in about the last six weeks. Um, our formatting will be uh, each presenter will be paired with a particular panelist. Um, the presenter will present, the panelist will ask some follow-up questions, and we'll proceed through everyone that way. Um, so uh, we have as our panelists, Jay Wengro, who is the uh, CEO of Actualize, um, as well as Lauren Pearson and Mark Corman. Um, Jay, if you want to uh, speak a little bit, introduce yourself. Sure. So I'm Jay Wengro. Um, and like Ryan said, I'm the CEO of Actualize. I'm really excited to see the capstone presentations that our newly minted grads are about to present. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, the capstone project is something that each of our grads create over the last uh, section of the course. And they are individual uh, pieces of software, uh, usually web apps of their own design and making. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of creativity and they put their all into it. So I'm super excited to see those uh, momentarily. I also just want to thank everyone involved uh, with producing this uh, amazing group of grads. Uh, so firstly, Brian Rice, the lead instructor himself who has been leading the uh, online format of our class already for quite a few years and uh, is a master educator. So thank you to him. Also wanna thank the TAs, Aaron and Austin, my fellow panelists, Mark and Lauren, and also the career support team, Lisa and Sarah. Uh, it takes a lot of work from a lot of people to make this all happen. So I'm really grateful to all of you and uh, just really uh, excited to see the projects. Me too. Um, so, uh... Our next two panelists, um, Lauren and Mark, um, if you can uh, say uh, what you're currently doing for work and um, one piece of advice you would give to a software developer who just started their first job. Um, we can start with you, Lauren. Hi, um, I am an automation developer slash product owner. Um, that's a new thing, but, um, so I automate QA tests for the company I work for. Um, and a piece of advice would be don't stop coding. Just always do something. I know Brian probably has said that like a million times, or he's going to tell you that like a million times probably tomorrow night. Um, just like always do something every day because if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And then you feel like a toddler getting back on the just life. That's me. I'm pretty, pretty cool. Um, Mark, uh, same questions. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mark Corman. Um, I graduated Actualize last year around this time, actually. Um, and I work as a full stack PHP developer for a company that builds uh, websites for car dealerships. Um, and my piece of advice would be um, just kind of understand you're gonna have imposter syndrome and be okay with that. Um, you know, I've come a long way since I first started coding and I still feel like I don't know stuff a lot. And, um, but, you know, and then, you know, you just look back at the progress you've made constantly and realize how far you've come. Um, so that'd be my one piece of advice uh, once, you, once you get on the job or just in general? I, I suspect um, with both Mark and Lauren's answers, uh, the, the current students are feeling those similar things. So 
good news, bad news is it's going to stay there. Um, so let's start into some presentations. Um, our first presenter will be Corey, uh, and your panelist will be Jay. Uh, hello there. Uh, my name is Corey Amano, and this is my capstone project called Turning Tables. Um, now, my instructor Brian may attribute the name to his favorite artist Adele's hit song by the same name, but the name of my app is actually based on the service industry's term uh, for transitioning a table from one party to the next or turning over the table. Uh, so the idea of the app is really to help restaurants that are struggling to staff their front of house operations with a solution of self ordering for customers. And so as a server myself during the times of the pandemic and seeing other restaurants in similar situations of constantly being understaffed, this project was really geared towards trying to create a solution to that problem. Uh, so turning tables was built on Ruby on Rails for the back end and Vue.js for the front end and designed with a lot of different elements of Bootstrap and CSS. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's dive in. Um, so this particular uh, iteration of turning tables is for a restaurant uh, called Ramen Land, a fictional restaurant called Ramen Land in San Francisco, California. Uh, and this is where we'll get to the landing page of the home page for the uh, restaurant. And then the uh, customers will then have the ability to go ahead and sign up for an account if they already don't have one. Uh, so standard form here where they can enter their name, email address, and password to create their account. If they already have one, um, like my friend Harry here, um, not the prince, the wizard. Uh, you can just go ahead and sign in and then be taken over to the menu. Um, now here at the full menu, we see that we can add some items here. So, you know, we always want to be healthy, start off with some salad, go ahead and add that to the cart. Uh, we'll see here confirmation that it's been added to the cart. Uh, we can go straight to the cart or continue to add more items there. So we're here at a, re a ramen restaurant. So definitely we want ramen. Um, we'll do some spicy ramen and add that to the cart as well. So as we proceed over to the cart, uh, we can see here now that each item is added. Um, if we want to add any extra uh, instructions here, such as if we want it to make it extra spicy, we can go ahead and do so, update that item there. And then see there that it's now extra spicy for this one. And you know Harry doesn't like it extra spicy like I do, so he wants it just standard. Um, and then, uh, you know, on second thought, maybe we want to remove one of the salads because we're here at a ramen restaurant, not a salad restaurant. So we can just remove that there. And then, you know, after a long, hard day of work, we want to just go back and add some drinks, maybe a glass of sake. And since there's no butter beer for Harry, we'll just have to stick with the regular craft beer there. And then we can head back to the cart. So as you can see, we can see all the items there now, including the new items that we added to the cart. You can just go ahead now and add the name to the order and then select if we want to dine in or take out. So tonight we'll dine in and then go ahead and place the order. So here we'll see now that we're on the order status page where we can see that the items are being prepared by the kitchen. And now the real benefit to turning tables is that on the kitchen side, we'll be able to go ahead and see now that there are tickets for the kitchen to work on. Uh, so we see here that Harry's friend Ron is also here dining in. Um, he has some items pending and some that are completed. Um, now the kitchen can go ahead and complete some of these items. And as that happens, back over on the customer portal side, if they go ahead and refresh that page, they'll go ahead and see that the items are now completed. So also the benefit of working in the kitchen um, from my own experience is sometimes you run something to the wrong table and you have to go back and tell the kitchen you have to make it again. So if that happens, then you just go ahead and revert it back to preparing. And then it's now back on that list to be prepared. 
Uh, so we'll go ahead now and just mark everything as complete here for Harry's party. And then we'll head back over to the order status. So everything now is completed in the order. And then we can just go ahead and click checkout and get our check. Uh, from there, you know, 6731, not bad for a night out in San Francisco. Let's go ahead and pay. Um, then they can just go ahead and enter in their information through the Stripe checkout. So harry at hogwarts.edu. And we'll just enter in a test credit card there. And we'll go ahead and pay. We'll be taken back over to the main page here in the restaurant and get the confirmation it's paid. And we can go back to the home page there. Um, so yeah, that's essentially the functionality here of turning tables. Um, and with that, I think it's uh, time to say goodbye to turning tables. Uh, Not yet. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. It's Dan. part of the lyrics. So <laughs> if you caught that. Um, this is an awesome app, Corey. The one thing that makes me sad is that Ramen Land is fictional. Um, but this is a really well thought out app, uh, very easy to understand uh, UX, which is uh, will make things easier for everyone. I'm curious to know uh, what was, I mean, there's a lot of features here, a lot of things that you thought through the customer side, the restaurant side. What aspect of this entire project would you say was the most challenging? I think managing time to get all the features in that I wanted. Um, working in the restaurant, both on the side of as a server and in the kitchen, understanding the complexities of what's needed. Mm. I think I really wanted to create a lot more features um, that I honestly wish I had more time to do. Um, but also from a customer side, you know, understanding as a customer, like how do I want to transition to be able to put things into my cart, put in some notes, be able to remove things, uh, get confirmation. And especially if you are self-ordering, how do you tell what the status of your order is? And so I think creating that order page is also really fun. Um, I think the ticket system was really fun and interesting. Uh, it was a lot of complexity to it, um, mm -hmm. a lot of utilizing uh, active record and figuring out on the back end how to maneuver around that to correctly display. Um, but I mean, it was all a fun challenge, um, a lot of late nights and lots of coffee, but you know, <laughs> it, was, it was worth it. <laughs> Got it. Um, cool. What, what, how did the uh, Stripe integration go? Is that straightforward or did you have to like wrangle with it a little bit? Stripe has a lot of great documentation. Uh, it takes just a lot of time to read through it and really practice it, I think. But um, Everything's really straightforward, I think. And I think as like, we all become a little bit more um, experienced, it'll become just quicker. So we can just, you know, go in there, dive in right away um, and be able to just follow the steps and figure it out. Got it. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that on some of the pages, when you like type things, other elements on the page update dynamically are using like Vue.js or front end framework to accomplish that. Yes, so that is Vue.js um, to accomplish those steps there. Got it. Um, this is an awesome app, Corey. Really nice job. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Corey and Jay. Uh, next up is James, and your panelists will be Lauren. Um, my name is James Hanabikian. Um, so that I created is called Blade Spots. The basic idea is just a place where you can upload um, your favorite skate spots, share it with other people, and then also um, have a place where you can find spots near you and filter by category and um, just be able to kind of find the best spots for you. Um, I created this app. Um, inspiration behind it was just, I've been rollerblading for you know a lot of my life. Uh, been the passion of mine growing up and then I still try to do it from time to time. And um, 
I have thought of something like this before because just in my experiences, um, sometimes you're out looking for skate spots and uh, you might forget where your where that spot was if you found a spot randomly or you know sometimes you don't want to be roaming around find like looking for spots sometimes they not might not be ideal um, for what you're trying to accomplish so um, just thought this would be a cool idea for an app have everything in one location and you know have it easy to understand and, and find the place you're looking for um, so yeah um, so I'll show you guys how it works um, so first you do need to log in in order to um, in order to see what's going on and, and everything uploaded from the uh, database. So here, delete that. I'll go in as Chris at remedies.com. It's actually in honor of Chris Haffey, who's uh, my favorite pro skater. So password. So that takes you to the index page um, where everything that's already in the database is already there. Um, what we want to do is we want to add a spot. So go there. Um, so I have a spot I took a picture of. Um, so say Chris is, he wants to share this with everyone in this community. Um, and picture is a rail. So let's say it's a uh, uh, non-rail by the beach. Address, let's do this location in Evanston, Illinois. We have a couple of drop downs um, just based on category, rail, skate park, ledge. So this is a rail. Um, bus level is basically how likely it is that you might get in trouble for being a spot that you shouldn't be at. So just something to be aware of so you don't get in trouble, you know, good to stay safe and, and not, uh, not get in trouble there. Um, so description could be anything uh, just to help out people that could possibly be going there. So I'll just say down rail, um, I think it's two step stairs and it's about hit pipe. So then we can go and upload the picture. Um, I think this is here. Okay, and you can hit submit and everything will get uploaded. Um, I am using Cloudinary, which uh, is a cloud service. And from my understanding, everything, this is gets sent in a JavaScript object to the backend where Cloudinary is, is applied. And um, then it's sent to Cloudinary, which creates a URL. And then everything is sent back to the front end for it to display here. Um, so a lot going on there, which is why it usually takes a while, especially if it's a high resolution picture for me. Um, let's see here. So I think this is it, a uh, steep rail near the beach. Um, and from here, there's a, a show page if you want more information, has all the info we put in there. Bigger picture in case you want to, um, you know, just see, see what it looks like in a bigger picture. And then I also put a little bit of a trick board in here. You can just upload what trick you completed there. So it looks like Chris completed his soul. So let's say Mizzou grind and hit add. You do need to refresh and um, then you can go and see the information there. Um, I just wanted to put that in. It's just uh, kind of inspiration, see what's possible at certain places um, and get inspiration for what you can try. Um, and this this rail looks pretty scary for me. So, I mean, Chris Happy is a professional roller. He can handle it, but I would, uh, I would be a little scared going down there. I'm not gonna lie, so. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, the only other thing is I think most people using an app like this might be not uploading, but necessarily, but you know, they would want to see what spots are available and, and use it that way. Um, and just like you can filter by skate park, rail or ledge, uh, depending on what you're looking for. Um, and then I also put in a map if you're looking just by destination and these are all the, um, spots that are populated from my index page. Um, and, uh, this is a Mapbox API map, um, and just kind of you can go around. There's a pop up where you can get back to the show page. Um, this is what we just uploaded, um, and it could take you back. And you can kind of just plan your day ahead. If you find a bunch of spots in one location and uh, have a fun day. So that is Blade Spots. Thank you for watching. Thank you, James. Uh, Lauren, you can go ahead. First off, great app. I love, I love the map. I did a map when back in my day. Um, and I thought that was the most challenging part of my app. Um, what do you think the most challenging part of your app was? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the map too, I mean, just to get it implemented, like Mapbox is pretty, it's pretty straightforward in the beginning, but then as you get more complex, I found that I was trying to implement 
like I like the map that I created, but I did want to actually put um, a feature that I didn't get to was being able to filter on the map itself and have something in there and interactive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's in the map box, you know, styles and layers and things like that. But there's a lot of documentation. And it gets there's just so much and it gets like really complex. So I didn't get a chance to. But, you know, that was something I definitely wanted to uh, wanted to do. But it, it was kind of the hardest because I did a lot of research on it and I wasn't able to actually implement it, much of it. But, you know, it was still fun, like researching and seeing what was possible. There's just so many possibilities of what you can create with Mapbox. So that's a really cool API. Yeah, I really like working with it, too. Um, what's your favorite part of the app? Um, I would say probably the, the map, just because I think that's, you know, if it was actually a live app, I think that's what people would kind of use it for mostly, you know, just like easy, easy way to see everything on, you know, in one location and, um, you know, kind of, uh, it has a pop-up so you can kind of see, you know, what you're getting into and, and go from there. So I think, I mean, it just makes the most sense to say, see that visually. Um, so it's definitely something I, um, I like about it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I really liked your app. I like the like the map part just because I know the complexity of it and I know how difficult it was, especially to be able to do some of the stuff that you did. So virtual high five. Um, yeah, good job. Thank you, Lauren and James. Um, next up is Oase um, and your panelist will be Mark. Hello, everyone. So my name is Oase, and my app is called Major League Stats. Uh, it sound, kind of sounds like MLB because it is like a baseball app, and the purpose is to be able to create your own fantasy team and add your players to it, and also you can keep track of betting odds. So I'm at my homepage right now, which I'm going to sign up for an account. Uh, let's just – I already have it typed in here, so let me submit that. And then let me save that, and then I'll sign in. So the first thing it takes me to is a home page, which I have like a little flex box with five slides on it. So they all have like little pics and facts on it. This is my favorite one right here. Uh, baseball fans ate 21 million hot dogs in 2014. So after that, I have a betting odds page, which is live and shows all the games from today. So these are all live. Um, even if I refresh it, they change minute by minute. So they're not always the same. And then I have a page here to create my own team. So give me a second. It takes a lot to load because there's like two or 3,000 cards. But um, if they're like a, a position player, it shows their hitting stats and they won't have pitching stats. But if they're a pitcher, they won't have hitting stats uh, unless you're in the NL because this guy has quite a few. So let's go ahead and add some players. So we'll add this guy. We'll add him. Sorry. It's a little bit slow, but. There we go. Okay. And then we can also search for someone. So we'll search for Tom. So we'll add this guy and here's my team. So I just put like five people on here and these are all pitchers except for this guy. So we'll remove him and we'll hit create team. So once your team is here, it's saved to the database and it shows all their stats and it's, even if you log out, it'll still be there. So if we log back in, still there on my team. So yeah, that's my app. Thank you, Ois. Uh, you can go ahead, Mark. Oh, Ois, this is an awesome app, actually. Um, for my capstone, I did a fantasy football app. So it's a subject that's close to my heart. Um, really cool. Um, one thing that ran through my mind is I remember when I built my app, it was really tough to like find data and find a good API. What, what kind of process did you go through to find the data and, and stuff like that for the, for the app? Yeah, so I actually used the MLB API and they have quite a lot of information on there. It took me a while, but eventually I figured it out. So it's direct from the MLB and it's pretty much, it did give me problems early on, but eventually I kind of figured it out and was able to link it up there. That's awesome. Yeah, because NFL is very, it's, it's a lot tougher to get data from them. So mm -hmm. um, 
Were there any features that you would want to add that you like had in mind when you first started the app? And uh, um, yeah, so I was trying to actually add a live score page, but that API was like messing up at the last minute, so I kind of just removed it at the last minute. Okay. Yeah. On this one, yeah, this just popped in my mind. Where where did you get the body mag from? The oh, that was another API. So I got kind of lazy and got all my information from APIs. Yeah. instead of just writing it in myself and um yeah there is i can't remember the name of the uh api but those betting odds are all from fanduel but i can set it to whatever i want to oh cool well yeah like i said that's really awesome app and great job thank you thank you oasis and mark um next up is mike your panelist will be jay Okay, can everybody see my screen? All right. All right. Hi guys, my name is uh, Mike Morton and the app that I made is called Run Share. Um, it's an app for posting runs that you went on, uh, looking at other people's runs and then commenting on them. Uh, it was built using a Rails backend with a Vue.js frontend and stylized using Bootstrap. Uh, so to see anything in the website, we have to log in. But before we do that, we have to make an account. So I'm gonna visit the sign up page uh, you get to like make a little avatar here. Uh, you can change its gender and then randomize its appearance to your liking. Uh, that guy looks pretty good, so I'm gonna use him. I'll just go ahead and enter my information. And looks like I fudged the password there. And then I'll just re-enter that uh, information to log in. Okay, so this brings us to the homepage of the app. We're not seeing any posts because we've yet to post anything or follow any users. So I'm gonna visit the users page to follow some people. Uh, here we get a little thumbnails with people, um, buttons to follow. You can click these and unclick them as you want. And then uh, go to next page. And I'm just gonna click a couple of these so we can have some things on our homepage. If I wanted to learn more about one of these people, um, I could click on their face and that would bring me to their uh, user page. We get a little bit more information about them up here. Uh, I can follow and unfollow from here as well. And then we can see all of their runs. Um, all of the runs in the sites look like this. Uh, you, you have a map that has a uh, bird's eye of where they were, uh, some information, and then you can click here to reveal comments. Uh, if I wanted to make a comment here and tell nice Johnny did a nice job, I can just uh, write it here. Then add comments, and there I am. Um, there is an alternate view for the runs. You can click here and see the map in a bit of a larger area. There's a little guy run in there, uh, more or less the same information. And this map is interactive, so you can uh, pan and zoom. Uh, once again, you can comment here. Uh, now that I've followed some users, I'll go ahead and return to the home page. And uh, now we can see all of the people that I've followed. Their runs are displayed here. Um, and this is paginated, so you can click through. Uh, this probably goes pretty long, so I won't go through the whole thing. If I wanted to share my own run, I can click this button here and I get this form. I'll just call this my run. Uh, I could use my current location, but I'm going to choose not to uh, on the live stream. And instead, I'll just go ahead and type in Chicago, Illinois, USA here. Uh, for distance, we can select our units. Uh, I'm used to miles, so I'm going to use that. And let's say he ran four miles, and maybe he did it in 35 minutes and 12 seconds. And if you click Create Run, and there it is on the page, right in the middle of Chicago. Um, looking here, the user Kevin has imported something from Strava. Um, for people that aren't familiar with Strava, it's an activity tracking app that uses GPS data from either a cell phone or a wearable device like a watch. Um, so if we click on Kevin's run, we can actually see the path that he ran on. 
Uh, I did a run on Strava this morning and I'd like to import that. So I'm gonna go ahead and link my account by going to account and link Strava. I do have to sign into my personal account here. So bear with me for a second while I log in. little bit of two-step. Okay. So now that I am logged into Strava, I get redirected to this page asking me to authorize the app. Um, I will go ahead and click authorize, which will redirect me back to the RunShare app. We get a little notification that uh, the account was linked. I'll dismiss that. And now when I go to create a run, um, I have two options now. Manual entry is what we did the first time around. And then import from Strava will actually send a request over to the Strava website and give the three most recent runs. Um, if I wanted three more, I can click here and request them. I'm gonna import my 5K from this morning, which is actually my personal best. So I'll go ahead and do that. And sure enough, there it is. And that is the path I ran this morning. Uh, and that is the app. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Jay, you can go ahead. Mike, I have to say I'm blown away by all of this. Um, I'm going to start asking about the Strava thing first. Um, so right here on this page where you can actually see their path, like what kind of data is coming from Strava that you are able to put it in that box like that, that it actually shows you that path? Yeah, so it's um, it's a format called encoded polyline. It's okay. just a long, messy string that you know no person could read. But pretty much, uh, I get that from their database. I save it into mine, and then there's just like a decoding algorithm that gives you uh, an array of coordinates. Um, which so map from Mapbox does that decoding for you? Yes, I believe. Yeah, I think I did use the Mapbox decoder for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the map box map itself uh, accepts that array of coordinates to draw the line. That's so cool. Did, yeah. did you have any, uh, was it easy or difficult to do the OAuth stuff to log in with Strava? It took me a minute. Um, <laughs> first, I had to figure out what OAuth was, like how the tokens work. Uh, and I definitely got stuck for about three hours on a web request because I was trying to use a get request when it was a post request the whole time, mm -hmm. which uh, was a little frustrating. But once it worked, I was paranoid that it would stop working for a long time <laughs> until it until it finally, you know, was just working. That's so cool that you're able to pull that off. Um, I also want to ask about the pagination. You have pagination in a couple of places. That's sometimes difficult to to uh, to implement. Was did you find that it was difficult to implement pagination? I was actually lucky enough that we had an example in class. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I leaned pretty heavily on that. Uh, but luckily Rails has like offset functions and limit mm -hmm. functions. So that made it pretty simple. Okay, cool. Um, and then finally, I have to ask about the avatars. Where, where did those great avatars come from? Yeah, I think I stole that from you guys. I, I don't remember exactly where it was but I feel like I saw Lisa maybe use one, but uh, it's Dice Bear Avatars and pretty much um, it's just a random seed. So every time I hit that randomize button, it's just like a five digit random number to make those different faces. So it's like an API that's creating them? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It's not, I thought maybe you just like had a bunch of like whatever PNGs sitting around or something. No, no, no. So it's generated by, okay, very cool. Um, Really, really nice job, Mike. Super impressive. Congrats. Thank you, Mike and Jay. Uh, next up, Adrian, and your panelist will be Lauren. So, here we go. This is uh, my app called Fresh Produce. I'll get thrown off by the groceries here. So, I created this page using uh, the back end with me on the Rails framework, and I use Vue.js for the front end and bootstrap for the styling oh, for my index page. 
So here about the about page tells you about what the company is about. And um, also since this company is located in the Pilsen area, I located, I hard coded um, some local stores in the area that I'm also familiar with as well. So there's also a user sign up page. Uh, I use vCrypt. JW2 for uh, password authentication, user, you know. And um, so I'll show you how this works. So I can sign in here with the user of Adrian. And here's the index page with all the products. So the user can find out what they would like at set products in the cart. And I use a faker gem to generate fake uh, data for produce and prices. That's why everything's a bit absurd with the price. So then basically, the uh, user can go to their cart after they're done um, shopping. And this is the cart index page here of all the things that they ordered. And this app is supposed to be like Amazon Fresh where you order your produce and get it delivered the same day. But this is only native to uh, the Pilsen area, which was, which was where I'm from. And I also added the operation location right here at the bottom. So straightforward app. Um, user goes to his cart, places the order, and they get a nice thank you message stating when their um, delivery will be delivered. And I implemented like a simple uh, JavaScript method that shows the time exactly when they order their produce. And uh, yeah, that's my app. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, Lauren, you can go ahead. What inspired you? Or why did you make a produce app? I think when it comes to styling different pages that I'm able to do that because I'm somewhat familiar with CSS. So I wanted to take on something that had, you know, a few pages that I can style uh, differently, such as the uh, index page for the local stores in my area. Also the sign up pages. So I took uh, more of a chance on like, trying to implement different styling for each page to make my page um, more unique. I do like all of my app was just very, um, very basic front end stuff because wasn't my favorite part. Um, I can tell that you're really good at <laughs> front end. <laughs> um, yeah. I really like all of the like the faker gem that you used, because I had a question, like, how'd you get all this stuff? Yeah, that's why the prices are uh, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I'd pay $8 for an avocado, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I really like the app. I, I really like how it, the front end look of it as well. Good job. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian and Lauren. Um, Aiden, uh, you are up next and Mark will be your panelist. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hi, my name is Aiden, and uh, my app is a Dota 2 social app. So Dota 2 is a video game that I have put many hours into, and uh, this app allows people to make posts, comment on posts about the game and then also create builds about characters in the game and builds are essentially just uh, character customizations of item choices uh, kind of like a character sheet in DD &D or something of the sort uh, yeah so here's the homepage, and uh, let's see some posts let's go over to the posts and uh, we can see some nice uh, a nice title who made the post, uh, what they put inside the post, and then the build that they're featuring in this post. 
This build is an early game uh, Rubik build. And the person that made this build was the user Axe, but Pudge is posting it for whatever reason. He's saying something about it. Now, let's see if there's any comments on there. Uh, Kunkka commented the same quote twice, so pretty interesting. Uh, I want to make a comment myself, so let's click on this post to view it, and I'll try and add a comment. Uh, very cool, Pudge. Oh, but I need to be logged in uh, to make a post because that doesn't know who I am. So let's go over here. Let's log in. Uh, I'll actually log in as Kunkka because I know all of his login information and I'm sure he doesn't mind. We get put back to the homepage. Uh, let's go back to that post. Click on that post and uh, make that comment again. Very cool, Pudge. Submitted it. Now it shows up. We can see that back in the posts menu uh, when we toggle the comments back on. That is now there. You know, these builds are pretty cool. I, uh, a lot of people are posting about all these different builds. Let's take a look at the uh, build page, see what uh, people have made. Here's the starting Phoenix build. This is the character Phoenix, and these are the items that they chose to put with him. It was made by Tidehunter. Got a little build ID in reference to when you want to add a build to your post. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Let's uh, make a uh, build myself. We go to the create build page, and uh, here we have all these images loaded up of all these different characters. Uh, and then here are all the items. Um, so I want to make a build about uh, this guy, Bristleback. This is going to be a late game build. So we're going to put in the timing of late. We can put whatever we want, but the convention for the game is starting early, mid, and late game. So use one of those keywords usually. Uh, let's add the items we want for late game. A heart, salt cuirass, lotus orb, and a uh, quelling blade. I don't actually want the quelling blade, so I'll take that out. And uh, let's submit it. Once we submitted it, we get redirected to the builds page and we can see our build right here. Uh, it's the build idea six. So if uh, we wanted to add that to a post, uh, we can. So let's make a new post. New post. I'm going to the title. Here's my uh, new late game build for Bristleback. What do you guys think? And then we'll add the bill idea six, we'll submit it. And here it is. I'm done using the app, so I'll just log on out and we get redirected to the homepage, right for the next user to sign on in. Cool. That's the app. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Aiden. Um, Mark, you can go ahead. It's really cool, it looks really nice. Um, where where did all the images and stuff come from? Did you hard code those in, or was that an API? Or it was an API. It was an so, API. yeah, yeah, I connected to Steam's API, which is the game library that Dota comes from. Got the images from there, the heroes' names and all that, the items' names. Was that pretty easy to use, or did you run into any difficulties there? I mean, the API was pretty straightforward in getting the JSON data itself. Uh, to get like this create build page was a little difficult with getting these images to line up so nicely, same size, you know, and uh, just appear correctly. But it was, the JSON data was simple enough. Cool. Uh, Why? Was there anything that like surprised you about the project that was, oh, this was really hard or this was really easy or this is what I really enjoyed the most? Uh, I really did enjoy uh, going through the API and uh, just getting that data to show up. Uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, learning how to parse that data because like these uh, hero names would have NPC underscore hero underscore something or other. So I didn't, you know, get rid of that in the string and put it as an empty space so that when you 
uh, see in the builds, it's just the name Phoenix instead of NPC underscore NPC uh, hero underscore whatever. So just parsing through the data is pretty fun. Yeah, that's cool. And you just did that in Rails with the yeah. Rails logic. Cool. Yeah, yeah. The the documentation for it was all about uh, JavaScript front end, getting the data there. So I had to just kind of translate it to Rails instead of doing to view because I wanted it from the back end. Nice. Well, yeah, looks really good. Should be proud of it. Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, next up is Carlos, and your panelist will be Jay. Hello, my name is Carlos, and uh, welcome to Yummy List, an app where you can search for restaurants and save them to custom lists. I, uh, I, built, I built Yummy List using uh, Rails for the back end, Vue.js for the front end, and I uh, incorporated CSS and Bootstrap for the, for the design. Uh, so I came up with the idea for Yummy List because uh, I always found myself to need an app where I can search for restaurants, add them, save them, and then quickly refer to them whenever I need to find a place for dinner, breakfast, lunch, uh, coffee, or just want to go somewhere uh, with friends or family. So when you first go to Yummy List, you see the uh, sign-up page and the login page. If you don't have an account, you can create one um, using your name, email, and password. Um, and if you have an account, you can just log in with, a, uh, with your email and password. So we'll uh, go ahead with an account that I've set up. And that takes you to the main page where you can see um, your list. You can create a list. Here we already have a list named uh, Post Bootcamp Dinners. And if you click on the uh, photo, a uh, pop-up uh, appears. You can see all the restaurants that are uh, saved inside that list. So for this list, uh, Post, Post Bootcamp Dinners, these are, these are some of my favorite restaurants I want to go to um, after boot camp, since uh, I should have a little bit more free time. And uh, to get out of this box, you can uh, hit the, uh, you can click on the X on the top right, hit escape, or just click outside. Then at the bottom, you can search for restaurants and then uh, add them to a uh, list. Uh, so right now, I'll walk you through how to create a list, uh, search for a restaurant, and then add that restaurant to your list. Um, I can Quickly go up to the top of the page by clicking on uh, your list in the navigation bar. So let's create a list named breakfast. And I click create new list. And uh, here's a list. Right now it's empty. We don't have any restaurants inside. So let's uh, search for a restaurant. First, using the uh, drop down uh, menu, I click on the list, breakfast. And uh, I want to add Bluestone Lane. But I'm not sure what the official name for uh, Blue Stain, Bluestone uh, Lane is. It could be Bluestone Lane Coffee Shop or Bluestone Lane Cafe. So I'm just going to hit um, search restaurant and see what comes up. So a few restaurants came up uh, have a var variation of Bluestone Lane. You can see the addresses where they're located. So the one I want to add, the third one, Bluestone Lane Cafe on R Street, that's the one I want to add. So I click Save to List. Get a vacation that was saved. And then uh, I can go to my breakfast list and see it saved right there. Uh, let's add just one more. Set breakfast, search restaurant. Um, I heard the Royal is a good one. Search restaurant. I can see at the bottom, it's the Royal on Florida Avenue. Save to list. Then I can check it out on my list. Now, if I want to uh, delete my list and start fresh, I can uh, click on the delete list button and I'll delete the list. And now we're down to just post bootcamp dinners. So that was the list. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you, Carlos. Um, you can go ahead, Jay. Carlos, this is awesome app. Uh, really clean looking design. Um, I Curious to know, firstly, regarding the restaurant data, did you just 
uh, put some restaurants in your database? Where is that data coming from? I used an, an API called uh, Documenu. And then okay. to solve the uh, pagination problems and the uh, web request limits, I export the, that API to my database. For, okay, got it. For just DC. Got it. So that's why I was like only, only showing up for like Washington. Mm -hmm. Right. Got it. Interesting. Um, awesome. What else, if you had more time, would you want to add to this app? I definitely want to add uh, a map inside each, uh, each restaurant list so you can see where those restaurants are located in, uh, in the city. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, the, uh, the front end looks amazing, but I'm curious to know, do you, you know, at this point, you know, with the experience that you've had so far, do you feel like you gravitate more towards the front end or do you prefer the back end work better? Um, I was actually thinking about this the other day at, at the beginning of the capstone and the beginning of, uh, uh, actualized, I gravitate more towards the back end. Mm -hmm. But definitely the last week or two, I uh, realized how fun and dynamic the front end the front end can be. Yeah, and uh, it really shows in your app. Uh, Carlos, really nice job. Congratulations, very impressive. Thank you. Next up, we have Christopher, and your panelist is Lauren. Hi, my name's Chris, uh, and this is my app, and it's uh, called Pinball Machine Finder. Uh, it's an app that's intended to be used to find, uh, it searches through an API uh, to find locally and globally sourced pinball machines. Um, and it's also a message board where people can post about their experiences with the uh, each machine they find. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, log in to start. I'll just use pre And it reroutes you right to the uh, regions page where you're able to use the search bar to search for uh, many different regions and across the globe. Uh, and I'm gonna go and choose Georgia because that's where I'm most familiar with. It's taking a while. I'm not sure what's going on. There we go. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this will show you a bunch of venue locations, uh, addresses, uh, the city where each pinball machine is located and the zip code. And you can also use the search bar up here to uh, kind of sort through any of that. So if you wanted to find all the ones, all the uh, pinball machines in Atlanta, you can just put in Atlanta should sort through each one of these to find the uh, specific ones in that area. There you go. Um, and the other part of my app is a uh, post out section where you're able to uh, make a post about uh, specific pinball machines that you might find and play on. And you can use the search bar to uh, search different addresses or usernames if you wanted to look up specific users' information or uh, what they have to say. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make a post. And when you make a post, uh, the title and theme is supposed to be about like the theme of the, um, the pinball machine. So for instance, you play like on an Xbox or X-Men. Uh, pinball machine and you want to talk about it you put that here you could say like i don't know that machine works great and you had good food or something like that you can put a, your personal high score that you got on the machine uh, and you can put the address where it's located and i'm just going to put an address that i know of from around that area. Show up down here. Um, 
can go in and uh, edit your post and uh, all that as well. Um, yeah, that's pretty much my app. Awesome. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, Lauren, you can go ahead. Where did you find an API for pinball locations? Uh, yeah, I was just kind of searching through the free information they gave us in that bootcamp, and I just stumbled upon it. I spent you, time doing that, so yeah. I was going to say, are you a big pinball person? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, sometimes, a little bit. What would you say was the hardest part of your app that you struggled with the most? Yeah, so um, the, one of the last features I wanted to get in was implementing a map into my location section. Uh, but I had a problem implementing that with uh, the API. So that was something I couldn't really get to, but it was uh, it would have been nice to get to it. Did for the um, the pinball locations? Did you seed that into your database, or does that get pulled from the API each time you load uh, the page? That gets pulled from the API each time. Awesome. Well, I really liked it. The nerd in me really enjoyed it. I'd like to use it sometime. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher and Lauren. Um, next up is Jeffrey. And your panelists will be Mark. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeffrey. And for my project, I decided to build a fitness tracking app called Gemology. Um, for me, me personally, um, when I work out, I like to be able to track my workouts. Um, so I thought it'd be a cool idea to build my project on that. Um, so here we are on the login page for new users. If they don't have an account, they can head over here to the sign up page. Um, I have an account already, um, so we're going to log in as Bob Ross. Uh, once you log, log in here, um, it takes you to our homepage. Um, has a carousel here of pictures. Um, once you scroll down, it has a list of all the exercises. Um, you can click on each exercise, and it gives you a brief description and the muscle. Um, I don't know if you can see with the... FPS on the stream, but they do have animations where they do come up as you scroll down. Um, on the top of the homepage here, using view filters, I was able to implement a search bar where you can um, dynamically search and the list of exercises updates. Um, also using view filters, I was able to add these filter buttons where you can filter by different categories. Um, so we'll head over to our profile page. And uh, we can see that he did some uh, chest and shoulders yesterday. Um, the day before, he hit some arms. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll do a leg workout today. Um, so we'll filter by legs. Um, we'll start off with some back squats. When you hit um, add to workout, a <clears throat> window pops up. And you can change the reps, weight, and sets using these buttons. Um, or you can enter it in. Um, so we'll log a couple workouts here. We'll do back back squat, um, we'll do barbell lunges as well. Let's add a little bit of this. Um, and as you're working out, you can go here to check out and see the different workouts you've added so far. Um, we'll go back and we'll add a couple more. Um, we'll try a uh, front squat maybe. Um, and then also, since it's leg day, we'll uh, do some calves as well. Um, do calf press on the leg machine. Go here and look at our workout. Um, and then say you weren't able to complete one of these, you decided not to do it, you can um, also remove it as well. Um, after you're done with your workout, you can click finish workout. It takes you to your profile page and has the workout that you just completed. And that is my app. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Jeffrey. You can go ahead, Mark. A uh, really nice app, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, it's something that I could definitely use after, you know, the COVID pandemic. I need to get back to the gym for sure. Um, 
where did you get like all of the I like the design of it like I like all the images and the and the uh, logo did you design those yourself get them from Google Images API or that um, I designed the logo myself. Um, I got these images from Google um, and the home page came mostly from a theme I found on Bootstrap. Yeah, it looks really good. Comes to you right. um, what was the most difficult part of the making the app for you, do you think? Um, the most difficult thing that I was able to implement, I would say it would be these um, buttons to filter. Um, because it uses the same view filter that I use in the search bar here um, and to get them to um, stay active and then have them get unactivated when you click and unclick them, I say was probably the most challenging part. Yeah, I remember the view filters being difficult in my project. I tried to, I tried to get them to work and I don't think I did in time. So I'm impressed that you got those to work. Um, well, yeah, like I said, it's really cool. I like the design. I like the idea and yeah, good job. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey and Mark. Uh, next up is Kari and your panelist will be Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kari and today I'm gonna to be presenting PetSource. PetSource stemmed from my own experience as a new puppy owner. Um, I was struggling to keep track of what toys and snacks I had bought my new puppy and ended up spending a lot more money than I wanted to and got a lot of duplicates. PetSource aims to reduce duplicates by keeping track of your pet's favorite toys and snacks. PetSource was built using Ruby on Rails, Vue.js, and Bootstrap. The first thing we're going to do today is log in by signing up. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I was listening to Taylor Swift before this as a way to cool my nerves and it worked. Um, I'll get here. This is gonna take you to the pet source profile where you see that you can see your pets, create a new pet, create a new item, as well as create a new shopping history and see all of your past shopping histories. Uh, we'll see all of those in actions, but the first thing we'll wanna do is create a new pet. So, um, I'm going to name it Goldfish. I'm a big fan of naming animals on things that they're not. So let's add a golden doodle. And here you can see that Goldfish was created. Um, down on the screen, you can also see that there's a button that says favorite snacks, but we'll get to that a little later. Um, the next thing that we're going to want to do today is create a new item. Using UPC the uh, items API, um, what you can do is add the UPC of the item that you've collected, and then that is gonna extract all the information for you. So as an example today, we're gonna be using natural balanced sweet potato and venison uh, as puppy food, which just so happened to be my Cinnabon's favorite food. Here, it takes you to a list of all items purchased, um, gives you a description as well as the dog food. Once created, um, we can go back to the profile page and we can go to see your pets. We can click on see favorite snacks and then add a new snack for goldfish. We'll go ahead and do that. Natural balance and five. And there you are. You can see that goldfish favorite snacks was the natural balance that we had originally added. There's one last feature um, that PetSource provides and that is keeping track of all of the shopping history. Um, what you'll wanna do for that is that you'll click on profile page, click on create a new shopping history. Um, we're just gonna do it for today. So August 25th, we can choose the item as well as the quantity. And there you are. It gives you a list of all of the past shopping trips that you've had so far. So that's Pet Source. Thank you for watching. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kari. Uh, you can go ahead, Jay. This is a fantastic app, Kari. Really, really cool. Um, a couple of questions. One is, is it just me? I feel like that there is probably a lot of complexity in like the database schema here between the items and the pets and the shopping trips. And was that difficult to wire together? 
Yeah, you would be 100% right. I think that one of the things that I would want to focus on if I were to redo this app is the way that I like thought about it architecturally. I don't think I had a good idea of what that was going to look like. And so what ended up happening was that I had to do a lot of like digging into the data. And I'm very grateful for Brian because I don't know how I would have done it without it. Um, But yeah, it was it was a struggle. Got it. Yeah, it definitely seems like it would be complex. Um, Curious to know more about the UPC API. So the the image is also coming from that API, right? Yes. Cool. Um, Was it what was it like working with that API? So the API was very straightforward and because it was so straightforward, it became really complex to like figure out exactly where all of the data was stored. Um, Mm -hmm. There was at one point where I had to do like a split, a slice, another split, and then a merge of all the strings together in order to get the images to show up uh, because it only returned a long string of like three reiterations of URLs. Yeah, so it was probably, um, you know, like a really difficult API, uh, even though it was so straightforward. However, on the research that I did, it was Reddit's number one. So (laughs) I can't imagine what the other UPC ones are going to look like. Yeah, so straightforward, but not so straightforward. At least it sounds like the data that they gave back to you you had to like manipulate it a lot to make it usable. Mm -hmm. Um, Cool. What would be the next feature you'd add to this app? Yeah, I actually wanted to add an inventory uh, purpose of this Mm. as well as like an Amazon button so that when you ran out, you could click the button and it would check it out for you from Amazon. Yeah, like the buy again kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Kari, really nice job. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kari and Jay. Uh, Next up is Matthias and your panelist will be Lauren. All right. Hello, my name is Matthias Mikkeljohn. Um, this is my app. It's called Filler Up. Uh, it's a it's supposed to be a fuel on demand app um, and it's supposed to be a uh, one stop shop for your uh, fuel from now on. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard from people saying they uh, get in their car and then there's absolutely no gas in it, um, whether they forgot to get gas or uh, some significant other maybe got in and used the car and didn't tell them that they were out of gas and needed it. Um, but uh, so this is meant to fix all those uh, problems. So basically, you'll be able to order gas, uh, pick what you need, and then a fuel truck can come out to your vehicle's location and actually fill up for you, saving you uh, the trip to the gas station. So I'll show you how that works, how I get started here. First takes us to a uh, sign up and login page. So if this is the first time you've ever used the app, you can sign up creating um, an account here. We'll, uh, John's gonna make an account here. Just put in your different information here. wasn't password, don't worry. Um, all right, it takes you to your page that uh, kind of tells you that you've got a account now and asks you to log in. So you can go into the login page here. That'll take you down to the login section of the original page. And you can after you log into your account, uh, it takes you to the home page. So you're going to have a few different uh, options and choices you can select here. The first one is going to be your Octane. So for your vehicle, you can kind of pick between uh, some of the Octane options uh, that you have and click on one of those that works for you. Uh, the next thing is you got to choose your amount. So you can either choose um, a gallon amount that you want, um, say 10 gallons, or if you just want to pick a dollar amount, you can do that. So you want $20 worth of fuel. Uh, The next is to put in your vehicle information. So um, if you've created an account, you'll have saved vehicles that you've used before um, to fill up and you can put an ID number in here. 
Uh, if you don't have that, like our guy John here, he's never made an account before, so he's got to enter in his uh, different vehicle information. Uh, he's going to have a Mustang today that he needs to um, fill up, put in his plate number here, and then create that vehicle. Uh, the next thing is uh, we got to tell the company and the truck where his vehicle is going to be so that they know where to fill it up. Uh, so we got this uh, map box API here um, and you can put in where your vehicle is going to be. Say this guy's got uh, just enough fuel to get to work, uh, but he knows he's not going to be able to get home from work. Um, he's running on fumes, doesn't want to have to go to the gas station after work um, when he's all tired. So uh, he works at the grocery store here, so he, he parks out here in the parking lot, so you can click on that. You can kind of pick wherever um, on the map that your car is going to be so that uh, the filler truck can find it. That'll save your uh, location, so John's been able to now uh, create a new account, uh, pick which fuel he needs, pick how much fuel he wants, um, put in which vehicle uh, needs to get fueled and where that vehicle is going to be. And then he just has to click create an order. I'll take you to the confirmation page. I'm telling you that your vehicle will be filled soon. And uh, that is my app. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, you can go ahead, Lauren. <clears throat> I love the idea of this app because I would use it all the time because I just hate going to the gas station because I'm lazy. Um, but what was your favorite part of the app? Um, my favorite part, I think, was when I finally got the uh, map working with a different marker to actually pull the location. That took a while to kind of figure out, but when I finally got that implemented, that was kind of cool. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, but you didn't have time or anything, any future iterations? Yeah, if, uh, if I had the time, uh, I would probably add, I wanted to add a, um, a schedule section so mm -hmm. you could pick exactly when, you know, if let's say you're at home right now, but you know that your car is going to be in the parking lot at work all day, um, but you're not there yet, you can kind of schedule a time frame uh, to have your car filled up. That would be one. Uh, the second one would then be like um, Corey did with the stripe um, for the actual purchase. I'd probably implement that. That's really cool. Yeah, I really like your app. I like the simplicity with the complexity. If that makes any sense at all. Um, but yeah, great job. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias and Lauren. Uh, next up is Patrick, and your panelist will be Mark. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Patrick Nicholas, and I made shopkeeper.gg. Uh, if you weren't aware, video games are pretty popular these days, uh, even more so PC gaming. Uh, and there are, like with that growth, there are a million different places to buy those games, be it on a platform, on a website, and it can get kind of hard to keep track of what's on sale, where it's on sale, and, and where you can purchase it. Um, so I made this app um, with the PC gamer in mind. Uh, they kind of come here knowing what they want. Uh, so the home page has a random assortment of games, uh, hopefully giving them the ability to maybe find the hidden gem. Um, first, we will log in. Uh, this is my email address. So if you know anybody looking for a junior developer, feel free to pass that along to them. Um, so once you log in, it takes you to the to the homepage again. Um, you're able to actually randomly filter through 24 different games at a time. Um, but in this case, I know that I've really been looking for this game for a while. Seems pretty cool. So let's see if I can figure out more about it. Uh, on the show page, it gives you the box art, the title, the uh, genre, the rating. The rating will actually change depending on whether it's above 80, above 60, or below 60. Um, 
you're able to add it to your wish list. I've been wanting this game, so I will add it to my wish list. Uh, you're also able to look through all the screenshots. Um, there's a carousel of YouTube videos that you're able to watch. And then I was also able to get the Twitch API and embed a live Twitch stream of each game. Uh, the middle section has all of the stores where the game is uh, for sale. And then if the game is on sale, um, it's denoted by this little banner and then it shows you the price change. And then at the very bottom, it gives you a list of games that you may enjoy if you do enjoy the game that's on this list. Um, it seems like it's my lucky day. Dead Cells is on sale. I'm able to actually click any of these store pages and it will take me right to that store and I'm able to check out from right there. Um, so that was pretty cool that it was on sale. We'll just pretend like I bought it. Um, since I bought it, we can remove it from my wish list. And then the wish list is actually uh, accessible from this little modal on the side. It will uh, show you what you have on your wish list. You're able to remove things from your wish list. And then it'll, this will take you to your main wish list page. Um, so these will all take you to the individual game page, but then you're also able to set an alert for the game if it goes under a certain price. Um, so for example, Terraria looks really fun. I really really want to buy it. Just doesn't look like it's on sale right now. Um, so I can go back to my wish list and say, you know what, I'll, I'll definitely pick this game up if it's under $15 one of these days. Uh, you set the alert. Uh, and then with this bottom button, you're able to manage your alerts. Um, I use the Cheap Shark API that has an alert system built into it already. Uh, and I actually have this pulled up here. Uh, and if I refresh the page, you're able to see that Terraria is now on my alert list for when it drops below $15. Um, and because I've been messing around with this for like three weeks, I have like 300 emails about games on sale now that I don't have any intention on buying, but this definitely works. So that's pretty cool. Uh, all right. And that is uh, shopkeeper.gg. Thank you, Patrick. Um, you can go ahead, Mark. Really nice that, Patrick. I really like it. Um, what I'm really curious about the design because it looks really professional and really well designed. Did you use mostly view? Is there a lot of custom CSS? Did you do like, do you have like a design background? It's pretty cool. Uh, thank you. Um, it is probably like 50% a theme and then 50% like features that I added in on top of it. I, um, grabbed a theme from one of the websites that Brian suggested and sort of Frankensteined it into what I wanted it to be. Um, I was able to like the modal is like a shopping cart modal that I was able to sort of dissect and turn into my wishlist page. Um, and then I actually did go in and make these pixelated uh, headers and footers and put those in. Um, and then all of the like pixelated uh, words, I also added in myself. Um, so yeah, it's about 50, 50 on the design. Yeah, it looks really nice. Um, Thank you. For, for like the YouTube and the Twitch stuff, was that the live stream, is that, is that actually live Twitch stream and it just finds the game by the title of the, whatever the API is feeding it or like, how does that, how does that work? So uh, as far as the YouTube video goes, the uh, it's called the IGDB uh, video game database and the YouTube video uh, URLs were actually embedded in the JSON data that I was getting on my callback. Um, for the Twitch streams, I had to go through, jump through more hoops than you would think for a company that's purely based on like streaming video games. Um, so I had to make like a backend call and then grab it on my front end and then like get a little bit of information from it, send it back to my back end to be able to get the Twitch stream on the front end. And it is actually like the highest viewer count stream that is happening right now for this specific game. Can you like adjust that? Of, is it only highest viewer count or is it like you can adjust it based on? So I, uh, not, I'm not implementing it currently because it was, uh, 
giving me some weird results, but I was able to write a function that was uh, able to filter like what language the game was in and then like where at in the return from the data the, the game was at. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the most viewed, but typically that is like the most exciting stream of that game is the one where the most people are watching. So I just decided yeah. to implement that on the page. Nice. Well, yeah, very impressive. Uh, nice work here. Thank you very much. Uh, last up today, we have Lucas. Uh, Lucas, your panelist will be Jay. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Lucas and I'm the proud owner and creator of Studi, a app built using Ruby on Rails in the backend, Vue.js in the front end and Bootstrap for styling. Uh, to provide some background on my app, uh, the world was hit with a pandemic early last year that basically caused every student at almost every level, whether it's middle school, high school or college, to start taking courses remotely at their homes alone. However, some people, especially me, study, uh, struggle to study alone, but at the same time are too timid to reach out to strangers. So um, I thought that Studi would allow students to create and join study groups in a very easy to use manner and makes possible for every student to meet new people and study efficiently, even when they are home alone. So first uh, I'd like to demonstrate signing up and creating an account. So as you may see from the nav bar at the top of the page, there is a sign up button that you can click on and it will lead you to a sign up page where you enter your personal information and password. So we can create one right now real quick. Uh, call it Bobby. Gmail.com, enter a password. And now we can sign in using the account that we just created. So once we log in, um, we can view, create, join, and leave study groups. Um, the study group, the search groups button here will show all the groups on the app or that have been created. Um, and you can also search for any group that you'd like uh, using any attribute that you'd like, whether it's the name, um, name of the group, description, uh, location. So you can just start searching maybe for the name, or if you wanna search for remote study groups, you can hit remote. Um, and obviously you can create your own study group and just enter the credentials. We can create one right now, uh, group name, Actualize uh, subject computer science location can be remote twenty students max and so we can create the group and as you can see it you refresh the page yep um, the group shows up at the bottom uh, to view more information about the group, you can hit the more information button. Um, and if you wanna edit any characteristics of the group, you can say edit and then hit update group info. And as you can see, the group info has been updated. So let's now join this group um, along with a few others. And once you join a group, uh, your groups will show up in the My Groups page, as you can see here. Same, you can also uh, filter your groups by using the search search feature. So um, once you join a group, you can hit the name of the hit the name of the group, and it'll guide you to the group page um, that has a chat function. So like. Um, and it will display the user's name. So once you're in the group, that's how you um, can communicate with other members in the group. And 
you can leave any group that we deem unnecessary. So just go to my groups, hit more info, and you can leave group and it'll no longer be in your my groups page. You can also destroy groups that you've created. Um, so let's say uh, you no longer need the study group at all. You can just hit destroy group and the group will be gone uh, totally. So I'd like to demonstrate the chat feature a little bit more. Um, let's say we join group here and then, oops, sorry, groups. Uh, yeah, I accidentally hit the log out button. Sorry, guys. Okay, so we join group, join group. Um, so if we log out and then use another uh, user, we can see that the chat function will be there for the same group. Um, yes, so that was Studi. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lucas. Um, you can go ahead, Jay. Yeah, Lucas, I love this idea. Um, it's a really great app um, and very useful, like you said, especially during a pandemic. Um, what would you say was the most challenging feature that you had to build in this app? Um, I think the challenging feature would be um, it was actually the CRUD stuff along with my theme installation. Um, I had the theme breaking really often for me, um, and it wasn't. I had I had I had struggled um, connecting it to like the backend features, um, things of that nature. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Those things can be pretty thorny sometimes. Um, what what feature would you add next? Um, yeah, so some features that I would like to add would be um, updating the chat feature a little bit more. So possibly having attaching and sending files features in the chat, um, having a search feature in the chat where you can search through previous chats. Also a video chat feature, something like Zoom, um, I think would be a really neat idea for remote study group sessions. Yeah. Um, that definitely makes sense. Um, of all the features in the app, or I guess the aspects of building it in general, which part did you enjoy the most? Um, I probably enjoyed watching groups being created and joined. Because uh, mm -hmm. I, I, that was probably the part that I had struggled the most with um, in the process. Just uh, seeing that groups were being able to, that groups were, um, getting joined properly, um, being entered properly, getting destroyed properly, things of that nature. Yeah, no, it's, and it's awesome that you feel that the most challenging thing is also the most enjoyable thing, which makes sense because once you worked hard at it and then it works, it's like Eureka. So that's really awesome. Um, yeah, this exactly. is, uh, yeah, this is a really cool app, Lucas. Um, I'd love to see where you take it from here. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I don't think that happened to anyone else except for me, which is funny. Um, thank you everyone for watching. Um, everybody did a great job. Thank you to Jade, the panelists, the TAs, career support, uh, and the students for actually making these apps that we can see. Um, so that's all for us. Um, we'll see you next time.